this is John Garner. I'm the uh, one of the Cyber Range engineers. I, I know Josh is here, but uh, I'm not sure if he'll be actively participating. Um, let me share my screen here. Can everybody see that PowerPoint slide? Yep. Excellent. So, okay. Uh, so as many of you guys know, uh, we were uh, very fortunately able to deploy Carbon Black inside the uh, uh, Tech Data Cyber Range. Uh, and with that, I feel like we, we were able to put together a really cool demo to show you guys. Uh, just a real quick, who am I? Uh, like I said, my name is John Garner. I work for the TD Security Solutions in North America. I'm one of the two Cyber Range engineers. Joshua Harp uh, is the other one. Uh, he's the computer network attack expert. Uh, I have more of a specialty in computer network defense. I've worked as a security analyst for several companies, both in an MSSP uh, SOC as well as a dedicated SOC. I've also had the opportunity to use Carbon Black's uh, products before. Uh, so I ha had a bit of actual real world experience using that and some incident response scenarios. Uh, okay, so before we begin, Something that uh, we at the Cyber Range have really been pushing lately is the concept of installation versus implementation. This doesn't just go toward Carbon Black. This is for any security tool that any uh, company uh, puts into their environment. Um, so there's, we, we see it all the time, both as blue teamers and red teamers of this whole like setting and forgetting. A company will buy a piece of software, they'll install it. You know, they heard the awesome sales pitch. They think that just out of the box, uh, you know, they're gonna be protected. So they install it and then they just kind of leave it, you know, default creds, default policies. Um, and they just assume they're protected. And we want to try to dispel this myth there are a lot of amazing security tools out there. Uh, Carbon Black definitely has a lot of great features, but like any security tool, you need to take the time to configure it and tailor it to your environment to get the most out of it. Security is an iterative and cyclical process. It should just be this constant cycle of testing, deploying, testing, deploying. You should never just assume that that your tools are gonna to be set the way that they need to be. And we highly recommend that when you purchase a product, don't just allocate money for the tool itself, but allocate money for training and uh, resources uh, to have a continuous testing and monitoring. Okay, so with that being said, we wanted to kind of talk about like, as we were, as we were trying to come up with what to show today, we wanted to go beyond just showing like some cool hacks and, you know, oh, hey, look at all this neat stuff we can do. And, you know, look at how Carbon Black blocked it. Like that, that's still like Carbon Black preventing these attacks is still the end goal. But we wanted to show the journey of how we were able to actually implement the tool to get it to do what we wanted to do. And I, I, I feel like that would provide the most value for everybody. And we... In doing so, another thing that we that we do at the range is, is something called the team purple concept where we have both the blue team and red team, for example, myself and Josh getting together and, uh, you know, ha having that iterative process of attack and defend in order to harden our environment and that this will, this presentation will, will kind of show the strengths of that. So starting out, we, we wanted to just kind of throw some some exploits at, at one of our servers and see how Carbon Black reacted. We started with Eternal Blue. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this exploit. Uh, this was the uh, the infamous exploit that helped propagate the, the WannaCry ransomware. Really, really nasty stuff. This is about as easy mode as it can get as far as a hack is concerned. Uh, and we we didn't go the live demo route because live demo gods are always so cruel, but we took screenshots of all the steps we took for the hack so you guys can still see everything that happened. So from an attacker's point of view, all you do is you load up Meta the Metasploit console, which is what we're looking at here. You search for the, the type of vulnerability or exploit you're looking for. 
In this case, we're going to use the MS17010 Eternal Blue exploit. Show options. We see all we really need to input is the target host we're looking for. So down here, I type that in. I say, hey, I want to I wanna own this box. And then I literally type the word exploit. All of this is done automatically through the console. It sends all the malicious uh, payload packets to the victim. And about 30 seconds later, you have a full uh, system level shell on the box. So when we, when we ran this test, we had two cloned boxes. Um, actually, let me, let me back up really quick here. Um, we had, uh, yeah, we, we had two identical boxes, one without carbon black and one with. So we wanted to do kind of an A-B test to see what happened. Um, with the box with carbon black, we did get an alert. Uh, you know, we, we can see here uh, the spool server EXE attempted a network connection, uh, phone home, reverse shell. So an alert did pop up uh, as, a, as a security analyst, you know, that this would have come in in your console and you would have been able to respond to it. And then you can see here some more details showing uh, some of the commands that were run, you know, who am I? Bad guys like to type that in a lot just to see what type of access they have. Uh, so that there was definitely logging and alerting that happened on the carbon black side. So as I said before, we, we ran this against two Windows Server 2008 uh, images. One thing somebody might be asking is, well, why did you test this on such old machines? Uh, you know, and not, not something more more current and fully patched. And the sad reality is, is so many enterprise environments still have very old out of date servers. So we wanted to highlight the strengths of carbon black showing that even on these old vulnerable servers, you know, you, you can still get a good detection and prevention. Uh, in this case, however, Eternal Blue was, was actually successful on both machines, but uh, carbon black did alert on the exploit. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight uh, that Jim touched on earlier was the live response. So this is a screenshot actually of uh, the, the panel and the shell that is available to you as an incident responder. So if you see that alert, you can drill down into the host and boom, you have, you actually have a system shell similar to what the bad guy had. You have all these options here. You can kill processes. You can delete files. Uh, yeah, you can basically kick the bad guy off the machine. You can remove any malicious files that they, that they dropped on the box. So, Eternal Blue was kind of a unique situation because after we ran these tests, we did some research and found that not just with Carbon Black, but with just about any endpoint uh, solution, actually stopping that attack isn't something that's in anybody's wheelhouse. And the best way to do it is through patching. So Eternal Blue takes advantage of uh, vulnerabilities in SMB version one, which is used in a lot of uh, outdated Windows environments. Uh, that being said, Carbon Black does have a very useful feature that can help with patching and remediation. Uh, using the live query tool, you can discover uh, what endpoints actually still have SMB version one. So as we can see here in the live query screen, there is a pre-built, uh, like Jim was talking about, there were 230 predefined search queries. This is actually one of them. So you just do a search for SMB, you find this, uh, uh, search, you hit run, and boom, we can see here uh, we have, we, you know, we found several boxes in our environment that still have SMB v1. So uh, as a security professional, you know, you can take this to your IT team and be like, hey, you know, we, we have a problem. We here, Here's the boxes that we need remediation on. And then from there, you guys will be hardened for eternal blue. So our, our second attack <coughs> was um, on a a, a type of web server uh, called Jenkins. It's a it's an automation uh, server. Uh, basically, on this box, there is a uh, a hidden uh, scripting uh, panel where it, it's meant to help uh, IT professionals where they can enter in scripts for their automation. But unfortunately, this can be abused uh, by malicious actors to run arbitrary code on that machine. So in this case, what we wanted to do 
was uh, create a payload uh, that would be a uh, reverse shell. Uh, so as you can see here, this is from the attacker's point of view. Uh, MSF Venom is, is a really nifty uh, program that comes on uh, Kali Linux um, that allows for quick generation of these types of, of shells. Uh, for those that might not be familiar, there's, there's two types of shells. There's a bind shell and there's a reverse shell. Bind shells are, are simpler and generally less effective. And those are where I, as the attacker, would do my connection directly to my victim. The problem with those is that generally there's a firewall in between the attacker and the victim and the firewall policies will generally block those types of connections. The scary thing about reverse shells is that those connections start on the victim's machine and then call out to the attacker. The reason why those are more effective is generally firewall policies are a lot more lenient when traffic is going out from the environment. So in this case, we're creating a reverse shell. We're making it as an executable file, just called payload.exe. And all we're telling it is, hey, this is the attacker IP here. This is the port it's gonna be listening on. So when you are triggered, you are gonna call out uh, to this machine. And then after that, we host our file on our attacker box uh, with a simple web server. So here, you can actually see a screenshot that this is the, the script console I was talking about in the Jenkins box. And we basically are telling it, hey, use PowerShell to download this malicious payload file. That's basically all this crazy code is, as we're saying, here's the attacker machine, here's where the file's being hosted, and we want you to just save that file called payload2 on the box. So here's a screenshot from the attacker point of view when that command is actually run. You can see there's a get request for the payload file, which means that it, that it was successful. So uh, Carbon Black, once again, it did alert. It said uh, that a TCP connection went out to the attacker box and the file payload.exe was saved in this uh, file path. Uh, next step for the attacker uh, is to actually execute the executable so that the, that reverse shell can be instantiated. So this is what it looks like from the attacker point of view. We basically run a new command in the script console. We say, hey, execute payload.exe. And then here we have uh, the attacker box listening on that port that we defined earlier. And then once that connection is established, you can see who am I and we have a low privilege shell on the server. So the attack did work uh, and we can also see more logs and alerting in the carbon black side payload.exe did establish that connection. So just to kind of sum up what happened, the attacker was able to run arbitrary commands via the script page on the Jenkins web server. The attacker leveraged PowerShell to download the payload.exe file and then execute it causing the reverse shell to call back to the attacker machine. From there, the attacker can go on to download additional scripts to elevate the privileges. There, there's all sorts of, of freely available uh, PowerShell scripts on GitHub uh, that, that can assist with this. Um, so the, we're circling back now to the concept of installation versus implementation. So far, all of this testing that we did was done with the default policy out of the box with Carbon Black. So the default policy alerted, but did not prevent. So what about the advanced policy? So out of the box, you do have the option of applying what is called the advanced policy uh, to whatever endpoint you want. Now, they're in a production environment. This can be kind of a scary thing because uh, you don't want any endpoint detection uh, software to block uh, legitimate processes from running and cause uh, system outages. Um, but but in any case, you know, from from the advanced policy, you can go in and you can you can see exactly you know for for different categories of events, these are the actions that it would take. Uh, in our first uh, run through, uh, Josh and I kind of zeroed in on this unknown application or process, thinking that. Uh, Carbon Black would would view payload.exe as such a process. So we 
uh, modified uh, these extra parameters to either deny or terminate the process. And when we did that, it still ran. So we were a little bit confused on our end. And that's when we reached out to the SMEs over at VMware. And this is where we want to emphasize the importance of communication, reaching out to the experts, because the, the solution to our problem was actually very simple. Josh and I, in, in a sense, kind of had tunnel vision. If we had just kept going down the list, we would have found what we needed. But this is the importance in the security community of communication and collaboration. So they told us, hey, keep looking at your policy. There's a, a specific portion that deals with PowerShell. And in this case, you can tell PowerShell to deny all of these types of things, such as communicating over the network. In, in most cases, you would not want PowerShell reaching out and downloading stuff. Uh, invoking untrusted processes, executing a file, a script, those are all very bad things. So why not just deny those? But these are all things that you have to, that you have to go in and configure yourself as a security professional. A quick sidebar, another thing that the SMEs uh, told us about, and this kind of goes back to that whole, you know, scary uh, deployment of advanced policies. This is one of the coolest features that we saw when we were doing this. There's this test rule button next to each of these uh, options. And when you run this, it will actually go through all of the historical events that it logged and tell you what it would have done had that rule been applied. So you can see, would this break my stuff or not? And this talk about a powerful, powerful tool, uh, especially if you don't have the budget for a dev environment, you can just apply this to your prod environment and see what would have happened. You know, if there's a, you know, if you really wanted to, to institute these policies, but you see that, hey, it's gonna break these two specific servers, you can then go in and, and do some whitelisting and, uh, and, you know, application whitelisting, uh, you can do path whitelisting uh, to make sure that those servers will be fine and then apply uh, the more strict policies to everything else. So this is an absolutely amazing uh, tool that's built in uh, to the Carbon Black uh, platform. And we can see here when we when we ran our test rule, so the, the top three here actually are, happened after we applied the policy and you can actually see the, the policy tonight. So I guess it's a bit of a spoiler, but all of these are ones that it would have flagged uh, from a historical perspective. So finally get to where Carbon Black prevents the attack. Once we applied that policy, we tried running our, uh, our exploit again. And uh, as an attacker, we were not even able to download the payload. So, you know, pretty high up on the kill chain, uh, you know, the, 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 the reverse shell executable, we weren't even able to drop it on the box. Uh, let alone do anything else. And so that this is the proof right here, you know, the, that connection over 8080 to download uh, the file, it was denied and blocked by Carbon Black. So to recap, uh, no tool is a silver bullet. However, with testing and dedication, tools can be configured to be far more effective than just their default settings. So purple team for the win, uh, iterative testing of policies and procedures will greatly strengthen your security posture. Getting red and blue team to collaborate is so important. We've, Josh and I have talked about our previous uh, engagements a lot. Um, and we, we tell each other stories all the time about, you know, red team is kind of siloed, doing their own thing. Blue teamers sometimes don't even know a pen test is going on, let alone not seeing the report afterwards versus if you could actually get them to work together in real time and do real time testing like this, where you fire off an exploit, you see what happens in the, in the tool, and then you adjust the policy and, and then run the attack again, you can very quickly and extremely effectively harden your environment and get the most out of your security tool. And with that said, uh, Carbon Black is an excellent tool for blue teamers to protect their endpoints, to gain visibility into their endpoints, and uh, respond uh, quickly to attacks. So that is the end of my presentation. <laughs>